Welcome to Joint Effort with Des Moines Orthopedic Surgeons. This podcast covers the pain and injuries that are associated with muscles, ligaments, and joints. Hi, I'm Baron Bremner, and this is the fifth episode of Joint Effort. Today I brought Jeff Rogers, who's a specialist in hand and elbow surgery and also a lot of other reconstructive surgery. Um, Dr. Rogers also has an interest in trauma and has written a lot of articles, including some on uh, trying to help with the opioid consumption problems that we have here and shedding some light on that. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks for having me. Now, I know um, like sometimes in the winter I will have a problem and I usually when I have a problem, I call you or I text you and ask for advice. And sometimes you're not around and you're, where are you in the winter usually when I can't get you? In the mountains. So I love to snowboard in the wintertime. Uh, been doing that since snowboarding first started. Um, so that makes me old, but also experienced, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, every winter, at least at least three or four weeks out. And do you, where is it that you like to go? Is it all over the place or is there one special place? Or? The Rockies, okay. wherever in the Rockies, I've done all kinds of experiences from, you know, stuff at the resorts, but also backcountry, hiking and climbing and doing all kinds of any, any weird like uh, helicopter type stuff or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, last year went to Canada. Really? Yeah, it was phenomenal. Wow. It was super cool. Um, just the Canadian Rockies are just majestic and just seeing them from that perspective was, was oh, really good for neat. you. That's amazing. Um, there's a lot of snowboarding injuries, aren't there, that you can get in the wrist and wrist like and that? hand, yeah. yes, and even some uh, ankle injuries are particular just oh, to snowboarding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, your hands and wrists are most at risk how's, and your head. How's an, uh, you know, you're a, you're an adult man who's a snowboarder. How do you get along with the uh, skiers? Is everything copacetic it's all there? Cool. Yeah. yeah. All right. We're good. Well, you did your uh, medical school and residency at Creighton, correct? I did. Okay. I, and uh, residency was at the University of Nebraska. As oh, well. okay. Are they a combined program? Some kind it was or? at the time. Yeah. Okay. Now, now there's just the program at the University of Nebraska. Okay. And undergrad was in Nebraska too? It was or? at the University of Wyoming. Oh, okay. Cool. And then hand surgery was at, at the Indiana... Indiana Hand, hand Center. Center. Okay. Well, um, I'd like to talk about a couple maybe things that people don't think of all the time when they think of a hand surgeon or an elbow or upper extremity surgeon today, not the typical hand type injuries we see, but you know, we use our hands to interact with so much in the world. There's a lot of potential for something to go wrong, whether it's getting crushed or broken or cut or burned or all sorts of bad things that you've seen, you've seen them all. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of tools, a lot of farming in Iowa, that sort of thing. So we want to talk about um, some bone uh, injuries that maybe don't heal on the first try or and you know options that we can do to make that heal and also talk about some nerve injuries and what the different treatments are for a, a nerve injury in the upper extremity okay sure sure um so first of all with bone defects you know it, when typically when we have a bone broken it might be able to go into a cast and heal or uh we might have to put a plate and screws on it and it would maybe hopefully heal so what are the scenarios where you see where something doesn't heal. Why would we ever have to do anything to help the body heal a bone? So it um, kind of depends on the severity of injury. If there's a significant amount of soft tissue injury around the bone that, that doesn't allow the blood supply to be adequate for healing. Um, where I tend to use even more bone graft material is, is in acute injuries with a, with a bone defect from the actual trauma. So uh, we usually see that in gunshot wounds of the hand, which are much more common than you would think. Um, and that results in an immediate defect that needs to be filled with some sort of bone, either bone graft from the patient or, or a bone graft substitute of some kind. And what's a, a bullet wound look like in a bone? It's not a circle. It's not a circle. It, it, <laughs> it takes a chunk out. Um, yeah. and, and it's very common. Lots of little pieces that are devitalized that at the time of surgery, once you get uh, finished cleaning out everything that needs to be cleaned out, then you're many times left with a gap that needs to be filled. Okay. And so, that's where we use bone graft. So there's a, the scenario where you're missing some bone for whatever reason. Um, what about, are there certain bones in the upper extremity or in the lower extremity where you know, sometimes they just don't heal and you have to do something for them? Yeah, the, probably the most notorious is the tibia bone that has a um, fairly high likelihood of not healing. But in the wrist and hand, it would be the scaphoid bone, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the wrist bones that doesn't have the greatest blood supply. So the, the shin bone, the tibia, yep. and then a lot of people might fall on their outstretched hand and break their 
scaphoid bone, which is on the thumb side of the wrist. Correct. And that one's notorious in certain scenarios. And so sometimes when that happens, you know right away that you're going to have a problem with it healing. Yes, especially if it's in the what we call the proximal pole or the end of it closest to the to the wrist bones. Or, I'm sorry, the radius bone. It does. That's where the blood supply is the worst. Okay. So, so you need blood to heal. Bones. Yeah. You need okay. need the nutrition to bring in the the cells and um, to reunite the bone. Okay. Um, are there any factors about what we call them? You know, it could be the host factors or patient factors that could maybe make things not heal. Sure. Yeah. The things you think about folks who are, um, who are still smoking or using tobacco products. Um, Folks who have diabetes, that also interferes with their blood supply. Um, and then there are some more unusual um, diseases. Some people have scleroderma is one that tends to increase risk of bone not healing. Okay. And that's a disease of, of circulation. Okay. Um, finally, another category maybe that you could touch on is like, this is kind of a weird thing, but some bones can just kind of die spontaneously, right? Even in the wrist. Yes, there's a, a disease called Keenbach's disease of the lunate, and and just for no good reason, it loses its blood supply and kind of turns to chalk. And so that's one of the little bones near the that other bone we were talking about. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so those are all areas where you might have to do something to augment or assist the body with healing. Um, so if if you see somebody where they're missing bone or and you know maybe it's all the treat, same treatment for all these scenarios, but they're missing bone or the bone's not healing or you know it's not going to heal. What are some of your options for augmenting that healing? So uh, historically and traditionally, the, the most frequently used bone was your own bone. So taking bone from one location in your body and putting it somewhere else. Don't you miss that bone? Do you, I mean, that's a great question. People ask that all the time. It's actually the, usually the inside of the bone, the, the marrow contents and what we call the cancellous bone, which is more of the honeycomb version of bone, not the, as you would think about a, a hard, tubular bone, not the, the rigid outside part, it's the inside part, that has uh, cells that um, can make bone. So we call those osteoprogenitor cells. That's a fancy word for bone, cells that can make bone. Um, it has some structure, so that it has its own, um, the, the cancellous part has um, a scaffold, or we call it the osteoconductive part. And then there's also um, you know, proteins in that called uh, bone morphogenetic protein and others that stimulate the bone cells to grow and to make bone. So those are the three components that you look for in the ideal bone. So that's kind of the, the, the gold standard in the past was something that uh, would have bone cells in it. It would have an architecture that would help bone grow through it and it would have some of our cells that stimulate bone growth too. Y yes. Um, and where would you guys usually get that from, you know, 10 years ago? 20 years ago, uh, five years still ago. even do it from the pelvis. It can be scooped out from the hip. That sounds <laughs> nice. Scooped it, scooping it out. <laughs> scooped out. Um, so you can get it from the from your tibia bone up by your knee. Um, sometimes, if you just need a little bit, we take it from the end of the wrist or the radius bone from nearby where from you're the working. Electron, Yeah, mm -hmm. the advantage of that is it's all in the same field. It's all in the same area. Yeah. Um, so I, I wasn't just kidding really about the you miss the bone but are, there are probably some issues that can arise if you take bone from somewhere you know a donor site sure there's always donor site morbidity or the what's the downside you have an additional place that can hurt that could be infected that um, on occasion can fail even if you take too much bone I've seen some people who've had bone harvested from their pelvis and then they crack through the it's called the ilium or the iliac crest that can break oh. um, so there, yeah, there are some downsides, and there's the time, the operative time that it takes to harvest it to consider as well. Okay, so there's the stuff that we can get from our own body um, to help heal, and then there's um, from other places too. Can you tell us maybe what allograft is? Sure. So the the allograft is donor bone. So it's bone harvested from someone who's passed on and donated their their tissues, and bone is one of them, uh, and um, it can be either just the scaffolding part, what we call the osteoconductive part, which is uh, just the, the actual sort of framework. Um, or now there's uh, products that are out there that um, really have come around as people are interested in augmenting spine fusion, but now that's translating now into use in extremity surgery. Um, and those are donor um, materials that still have live cells in them, which is 
kind of a paradigm shift in the whole bone grafting world because now you have the opportunity to bring in those other factors that we talked about that are beneficial from your own body but having it harvested from someone else and by so it's some, live cells but your body doesn't reject them that's like the a kidney amazing. or anything like that yeah the amazing part okay. you don't have to take anti-rejection medicines um and they're not rejected because they they the cells that do have antigens are all cleared out and somehow these companies have figured out hmm. ways to preserve the cells that aren't antigenic but also but still make bone and and make the proteins that stimulate cells to make bone so um you don't have the donor site morbidity you uh, don't have a reaction to the you know to a foreign object or whatever uh, is there a downside to things like that yeah the big question out there that has not been proven in a head-to-head -head competition is is it still as good now in in the lab you can show that yes the cells are alive and and that they the proteins are there that stimulate cells to do what you want them to do um, and bone grows in the lab but um, i'm not aware of any great head-to-head -head. we're going to take 100 people and they're going to have a similar defects and you're going to get either get bone from your hip or from the the donor site and we're going to see who's better that that study has not been gotcha. done yet and it might cost something too right to use Cor yeah there's some expense to okay. it um but uh, probably if you really wait it out the, the decreased operative time would uh, would offset the expense okay. of the product sure sure um so what have you seen kind of just briefly before we move on to the other type of injury we're going to talk about what have you seen with results with something like that uh, you know the newer things do they like fill in large defects yeah i've been tracking a case series of my own i have 20 cases so far of this the material i've been using lately um and uh the results early results are pretty amazing um hmm. the, all the defects so far have healed wherever i put this material mm -hmm. healed at the same rate i think that normal bone in the past would have um and haven't seen any side effects or issues with the oh, product oh, that's amazing mm -hmm. Well, great. Uh, that's what we're going to talk about on bone repair, bone defects and their treatment. But I'd like to move on to another uh, thing where we when we stick our hand in a table saw or uh, farm implement auger, um, <laughs> we, yeah. we can get some nerve injuries, too. And the nerves are the small little conduits that send messages to and from our brain, whether it's and we'll be talking about sensory nerves, which are feeling things, you know, and perceiving our environment or motor nerves, which are moving our muscles and moving our body around. Um, what type of traumatic nerve injuries do you see well, often? Mostly either saw injuries from table saws like you described. Um, around Halloween, we see lots of pumpkin carving injuries. Um, and then gunshot wounds will also take out chunks of nerve that need to be reconstructed. Okay. So let's say um, it's a, what we might say a clean wound. You know, you get a cut in your nerve. You've noticed that your sensation's gone somewhere in your hand. Um, you go to the ER. What kind of timeline are you looking at to repair something like this? Is it something you have to do right then? Can you do it a couple days later? What happens? That's an urgent but not emergent problem. It's nice to get to sensory nerves within the first so week or so. Otherwise, they do tend to retract, and then you have a gap that you have to deal okay. with and could turn from a problem that could be primarily sutured back together under the microscope to one that needs a gap filled either with your own donor nerve or an allograft or a donor nerve from a cadaver like like we were talking about with bone the same can be said for nerve other than the, the, the nerve allograft does not have live cells in it and what that's a little interesting difference between nerve regeneration and bone growth uh, bone it grows in its live tissue and it grows back to become bone again nerves when you cut them the nerve dies from the point the nerve is cut to the end of the fingertip, for instance. And um, if the nerve's reconnected, the, you will grow a new nerve inside the old one. Or if there's a gap, you need to fill the gap with either your own nerve to guide that, that regeneration or a donor nerve that has the same little tubules that, that allow the nerve to regenerate. So you can um, you get a microscope in there. These are tiny little things, right? They're pretty small, yeah. Tiny little instruments, too? Yeah, the nerves are your finger, probably the size of angel hair, angel hair pasta. Okay. So imagine sewing two ends of angel hair pasta together. How many stitches do you put in two ends of an angel hair pasta? Then? Three? About six to wow. eight. Wow. And, and we use um, sizes of suture yeah. that are um, probably about the third the thickness of a human hair. Wow. 
And so a microscope, it, you don't have the special glasses. It's more than that. You need closer up than the loop we vision. We use microscope. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, you were alluding to this, but uh, you know, if there's a gap, you know, a small gap or a chronic nerve injury or a bullet injury, that sort of thing. Um, let's say you use your own nerves for that, but it's a bigger nerve. What do you do, you know, to make the nerve? You want to take like a nerve from down in the leg or something, turn it into a nerve in the arm. Can you double it up or triple it up or make a bigger nerve? Yeah, so uh, the common nerve to harvest for a large defect, for instance, in your forearm would be the sural nerve, which is a nerve on the outside of your leg. Um, the nice thing about that is it does leave you with a numb spot on the outside of your foot. But um, if you're able to recover function, motor function in your hand, for most patients, the trade-off is worth it. And if the nerve is bigger, in the form than the sural nerve, then we do what are called cable grafts, where you take two or three strands of it and bridge the gap. So it looks like a coaxial cable, like their cable, you know, with all the little cords in it. Exactly. Bridging that gap. And I, you know, I was reading about something else like using uh, uh, veins or something as a conduit for gaps too, and letting the nerve grow through that. Is that something that is yeah, done? 10 years ago, there was some interest in, um, initially the, the concept was a vein, but the problem is veins, they tend to collapse, but they're still kind of guided those those nerves to trying to try to bridge the gap to reach the, the other end of the cut nerve. Um, and then some interest came out to uh, absorbable conduits that were made of uh, the same thing that absorbable sutures are made out of. And they worked okay, but the gap more than about you know, one and a half centimeters, it really, did, and that's about, um, a little bit less than an inch would, would kind of fall off. The regeneration didn't do so well. And then most recently, now processed allograft nerve uh, has been shown to be able to bridge much larger gaps, especially for sensory nerves, probably up to five to seven centimeters. Wow. Which so that's is nerve from a donor? Correct. And it's been processed so that it doesn't have any antigenicity or a reaction? You won't to the... react or reject okay. it. Okay. It's just a simple conduit for your own nerve to grow back through. Oh, okay. So it's just kind of the outside of it. It's not really sending it's... the signals? Correct. It, okay. it's, yeah, look, so when you repair a nerve, it's not like plugging in electricity. That'd be cool. But it's more like giving that nerve a guide to tell it where to grow and sprout. So, you know, I remember hearing something like a nerve grows a millimeter a day or something like that. Is that, it's gotta start over at the, up at the brain and, or the spinal cord and grow out or Well, what? the nerve, the cell body's in the spinal cord um, and that's where the, all the nutrition and the signal, and but the actual nerve does reach, start growing and the nerve um, regeneration factors are, are generated at the site of the injury. So um, it recovers from that point a millimeter per day. Oh, okay. How long, so let's say you do some, um, either a sensory nerve or a motor nerve repair in the hand and it's something you get to right away and you're happy with it. How long before you notice any improvement typically? It all depends on how close it is to the end organ, whether that's the muscle or the, for instance, the end of your finger. Um, so an injury of the finger, most patients within a couple months starts getting huh. sensation back. Um, I've had some higher level injuries take six months to a year to be as good mm. as, they, as they were gonna get. Um, and so, there, you know, there's some other injuries uh, where you stretch a nerve called a neuropraxia, where you don't really have to do any surgery, but you kind of observe those and some of them come back. Can you tell us about a neuropraxia briefly? Yeah, the most common one that I see would probably be the radial nerve in the, around the back of the humerus or arm bone. When folks break the humerus, that nerve frequently gets stretched because it's right on the humerus bone, um, but almost always recover, uh, but it takes at least three to six months to start seeing recovery of the And that's got, if it's, if it's injured at the mid humerus, it's got to grow from there down again or recover. Correct. Yeah. It has to regenerate. There's got to be some times when you can't fix it. There's no nerve, the motor nerve or the strength nerve doesn't work. And so you're also a hand and elbow specialist. What do you do to help somebody who needs function to the hand and you can't fix their nerves? Right, so the cool thing about the upper extremity is that um, there are lots of expendable motors. So uh, you could repurpose those motors. So if you have a radial nerve injury, for instance, at the humerus that uh, results in a wrist that drops or fingers that don't straighten, um, that's pretty debilitating, hard to shake hands, hard to hang on to things. Um, but thankfully we have extra motors that would bend your wrist that can be rerouted and reconnected to the tendons on the back side of the hand and wrist to straighten your fingers. So, so you could take an expendable wrist bender flip it through and make it into a wrist extender. Or a finger extender. Okay, Correct. all right. That's pretty awesome. 
it's pretty it's pretty immediate too you don't have to wait for regeneration uh, the downside is that the the excursion is never as as normal as it was but it's so much better than nothing yeah, right. um, and and uh, patient satisfaction with those procedures are very high this is a little off topic but um, tell me your rules about re somebody gets their finger cut off and depending on what finger it is how many fingers it is and uh, how long it's been off Tell us what your rules are and if you put them back on or if you don't. Sure. Uh, so indications or reasons to consider replantation of digits. Um, you know, in the 80s, it was a very popular thing to do and try. And then we learned that um, it was patients were- to try and put them all back on, you mean? Correct. Okay. It, and not everyone did so well. And so then the indications kind of tightened up or the reasons to con consider it tightened up. Uh, certainly anyone with a thumb injury, a uh, thumb loss of a thumb, even if it doesn't move well, uh, if it replants and is, and is successful, it, it significantly improves ha hand function overall. Uh, you can kind of push, even if it doesn't move, you can push it's, against it. It's a post, yeah. correct. Okay. And so you can still hang on to things and function very well. It's very debilitating mm -hmm. not to have a thumb. It's hard to hang on to things. So no matter what, you try and get the try thumb Try to get on. the thumb. Okay. Um, then multiple digits, most would su suggest that that's an indication because having multiple missing fingers um, is probably worse than having replanted stiffer fingers. Mm -hmm. uh, and then some people would argue that any amputation in a child is one to okay. consider um, just because they have the potential to, to heal, better to than heal and move better down yeah. the road. Um, things, reasons not to put them back on, that's probably more important. Right. A single digit, at least in the United States, our cultural system isn't so wrapped around being a complete person like it is in the Confucian moral value system, which is kind of interesting. There's mm -hmm. even a cultural consideration. Um, a single digit uh, probably isn't an indication or reason to put it back on. Um, or even um, injuries um, that are out towards the fingertips. And the reason that you're not putting them back on isn't because you're just not wanting to come into the hospital and do it. It's because they aren't always great. Is that what you're saying? When you, like you lose a ring finger, and you put it back on, it might be stiffening in the way or something. Correct. Like that. Okay. Yeah. So you, you don't want to make compromise their function just because you can do something. Right. Um, and that's based on a lot of studies the... from the 80s and 90s. Correct. That's what you're saying. Okay, great. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show. And I think you've had a lot to uh, tell us about these complicated injuries. And I'm, I, for one, I'm glad that you're around when I have these injuries when I'm on call. Oh, no worries. Thanks. All right. <laughs>